the regular guy on the street, regular folks, regular families don't know where food comes from. They aren't able to imagine what a farm is. They aren't really able to picture what that looks like or where food comes from. And if regular folks don't understand where food comes from, then we can't really expect them to help make decisions about making sure that food will be there in the future. And so this disconnection from food is, is a key problem that's facing our culture. I'm John Lewis, and you're listening to 360 Degree City, a podcast where we talk to people who are working to make cities better. Our hope is that after each episode, you'll start to see your own city from a slightly different angle. Over half of us now live in cities around the world. By 2050, the global population is projected to hit 9 billion people. Feeding all those urban mouths is one of the big challenges of the future. So we wanted to talk to someone that's figuring out how to connect people in cities and the food that they eat. My name is Aaron White. I'm the principal and founder of a Raleigh, North Carolina-based design and consulting firm called Community Food Lab. All right, Aaron, thanks for thanks for joining us today. And um, maybe we'll get started with if you could give a, kind of a quick background on how Community Food Lab came to be. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here and to um, share more of, of what I do and just looking forward to a great conversation. Um, thanks for having me. Um, Community Food Lab uh, actually grew out of um, my architectural degree. Um, and it, it came out of a design thinking education. Hey, I'm Jean, an intern at Intelligent Futures. Just thought I'd chime in to let you know a bit more about design thinking, something that Aaron and John talk about a lot in this episode. Design thinking is a human-centered and collaborative approach to problem solving, which requires bridging the gap between knowing and doing. It encompasses many different elements, including building empathy for the people you're designing for, learning from the experience of others, rapid experimentation and prototyping, storytelling, and joining forces with people across disciplines. Now back to Aaron. He's talking about how his education in architecture led him to start Community Food Lab. My architectural studies started to be more about urban design and more about systems and communities. And as I started to get interested in food as as a way to positively impact communities, uh, I was actually able to draw on a number of other experiences in my life. So, so architecture, if you look at it in a certain way, might be my third or fourth career. Um, and then food systems planning is another one on top of that. So, um, but I've been a cook and a chef. I've been a carpenter. I've been a public health statistician. Um, spent a lot of time working on farms in high school. And um, design thinking became a way for me to tied together all those different experiences and all those different understandings of how the world works and think about food as this bridging idea that is essential for communities. It's essential for human beings. Three times a day we need a meal, but it also unlocks things like public health. It unlocks ecological issues and climate change issues. And uh, it really is a way to engage all kinds of different people in in conversation about communities and in about kind of the directions of our uh, local government. Um, it's just, it ties a lot of things together. And Community Food Lab is the uh, kind of the plan, the framework, I guess, or the structure that I've built to allow me to be a designer in food systems. A food system incorporates all the activities involved with feeding people, from production, processing, and distribution to the consumption and disposal of food. That's great. I'm wondering if you can maybe speak a little bit about um, the idea of design thinking that's grown, um, seems over the last few years, has grown quite a bit in terms of uh, the attention that it's getting um, in the business world particularly, but in in other areas. Um, Can you maybe talk about how design thinking ties into the creation of healthy food systems? Yeah. So, so for me, I think design thinking really centers on, on a way to solve our most complex problems, most complex challenges. Um, things like 
childhood hunger, for instance. Uh, it's a big problem. It's a massive problem. And there's no single right answer for that. And beginning to solve it requires an understanding of the problem, but also a big picture, open-ended approach that allows new ideas and innovation and new insights to come into potential solutions. Um, and design thinking is really the way to capture that open-ended approach to problem solving. And food systems generally I see as one of these big, complex, really urgent problems facing us. And we need to bring scientific knowledge. We need to bring um, human understandings. We need to bring a lot of different kinds of thinking to food system problems. But design thinking provides a way to capture all of it together. Um, it'll, design thinking allows you to incorporate some quantitative problem solving as well as really qualitative sort of softer approaches. It also lets you uh, integrate – you know, a leap of faith now and then. It lets you, um, you know, follow follow hunches and um, sort of test things out as you go. And these these problems are so urgent, I think, and so hard to see the ends of that being able to work creatively, being able to work as a designer in these problems allows many more solutions to come to the table. Great, great. And so, so I think um, what's interesting with with food systems, and one of the big challenges is that uh, food that there's no central authority that controls or manages a food system. And so, and for a lot of folks, particularly folks that live in cities, um, food just kind of appears. Uh, so can you maybe describe uh, components of what a food system is and, and what your interpretation or definition of a healthy food system is? Mm, sure. Well, I think the one thing you touched on just then is that many people just think food appears in the city. And one, one of the biggest problems that I see and one of the biggest challenges is that the regular guy on the street, regular folks, regular families don't know where food comes from. They aren't able to imagine what a farm is. They aren't really able to picture what that looks like or where food comes from. And if regular folks don't understand where food comes from, then we can't really expect them to help make decisions about making sure that food will be there in the future. And so this disconnection from food is is a key problem that's facing our culture. Um, and the food system, you know, everything that connects to link farms and distribution and proce food processing, all kinds of marketing and kind of food retail, all those different pieces make up this food system. So when you or I might walk into a grocery store or might sit down at a restaurant, that's just one end of that system. But there are many, many steps before that, before that happens uh, that really are all the parts of this system that gets it from farm to a table, and then also includes the uh, how you handle the food waste through composting or um, other kind of recycling, ideally. Um, so, so the food system is that really kind of big set of parts that all links together. And you had another question in there that I forget. I, uh, the, what what your definition of a, a healthy food system is? Oh yeah, a healthy food system. Um, so I think I see it as a, as a gradient. Um, on one end of the gradient is kind of what we have now. It's a big global system uh, that's managed by you know, a few dozen big corporations, um, huge farms, and food moves all around the world every day. And the problem with that, the why I think that's unhealthy, is that it's subject to uh, political changes. It's subject to kind of global economics. It's subject to climate change. It's, um, you know, a really kind of fragile system in many ways. And, and so that's sort of, I think our sort of status quo right now. And I would say that that's on one end of this gradient. And when you work to the other end of the gradient, things get much, much smaller and people in neighborhoods, people in communities participate in very different ways. And, the smaller scale localized food system 
um, allows people to really make their own decisions about food. It allows people to participate as a grower of food or as a business owner in the food system. Um, it lets people make decisions as a community about what, what's important to them, what matters. Um, and sort of at one end of that, if you take it to its logical extreme, all the food in your community would be grown in your community. Um, now that's a little unrealistic and working through the seasons and being able to feed all the people on the planet, I think will be very difficult to do, um, in that model. So for me, a healthy food system is one that is somewhere in the middle where we do have some large global production to make sure that everybody has the, the sustenance they need. But then there's a lot more of this small local food system projects that allow people to connect to each other, to connect to food, to allow us to make food-based ecological decisions and local economic decisions. There's a lot of good things that happen when a food system becomes more local. And so I think that there's sort of an an unhealthier end of that spectrum than a healthier end of that spectrum. And, and our work is really about helping organizations and local governments move towards the smaller scale, local, healthier end of that. Great. Mm-hmm. Great. And I think that's a really important uh, point you make. And we I know we've talked about this in the past, that idea of the spectrum um, versus the sort of false either or scenario. So um, folks that work in big agriculture um, completely discount uh, local action and folks that are on the local level uh, think that the the global system totally doesn't work. And I think that your idea of the spectrum and moving along that is is really uh, important. And, you know, you have mentioned climate change and the impacts on the global system uh, that can also happen locally so if a place were to shift their uh, their food supply to let's say 98 percent of their food comes locally one of the symptoms of climate change is those extreme weather events so if all that food gets wiped out with a massive storm a hailstorm, what have you then you need to be connected to that broader system to provide resilience and 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 some backup so to speak oh absolutely yeah and I think the hallmark of a resilient system is diversity. And we have so many resources at hand. We have massive farms. We have incredible agricultural technology. So, so we have all these resources at hand. And to me, the wisdom in that is really to draw on all of it and to use it in its appropriate way. Um, I actually just saw, um, I saw a tweet just before getting on. Uh, somebody from a big ag school, big ag university in, uh, in the U S said that, um, ideology doesn't grow food. Science grows food. And while yes, science is important. I agree with that part of it, but I also have a big problem when anybody draws a line and says one or the other, because I think it is really an all, it's an all hands on deck approach. We have to use all of our resources if we actually expect to have a food system that works a hundred years from now. You're listening to 360 Degree City. Today, John is talking to Aaron Sullivan White, founder of Community Food Lab. We're talking about the importance of diversity in our food systems. Huge industrial farms are necessary if we want to feed everyone. But local, small-scale food production is also key if we want to ensure that our food systems are resilient and healthy. So I'll just throw a few facts at you that I've gathered over the last while. So we now have over half the world's population that lives in cities, and that's projected to increase to two-thirds of the world's population by 2050. The global population overall is projected to increase to 9.7 billion people by 2050. And so to feed those 9.7 billion people, the increase in food calories up to 2050 needs to increase by about 70%. So your all hands on deck approach, I think is, is spot on. Can you maybe speak to the role that you see in urban agriculture, growing food in cities, playing a role in those huge trends that are happening in the world? Yeah. So when, when you mention 9.7 billion people and the amount of food that they'll need, um, it can be tempting to say, well, let's just have enough farms to grow that much food. But that leaves out the whole distribution problem and the preservation problem, um, that the food is not always grown where people are. And so that food has to get moved to where the people are. And when the whole population begins to concentrate in cities, you see that obviously 
this disconnect between where farmland is and where people are. Um, now, urban agriculture is, I think, part of a solution. I think better distribution systems um, are part of the solution also. But urban agriculture has the potential to grow quite a bit of fruit and vegetables. Um, there are some pretty well-advanced agricultural systems. Um, you can also grow you know, small livestock in cities, uh, both at the household scale, but also at the commercial scale. Um, and when you do that, when you create sort of highly productive agricultural projects within a city, you're also creating jobs where the people are. And so you start to connect economic opportunity with food access, with oftentimes creative use of unproductive space, whether it's rooftop or, um, you know, transportation right of ways, places that otherwise wouldn't get developed. Um, and so if you can move just a portion of food production right into cities where people consume it, then you would expect to have a number of benefits. You'd expect to employ people locally. You'd expect to have shorter uh, distribution distances and transportation distances. You'd expect people to have a visual image of where food comes from, what a farm looks like. So if you had a farm in a city, you know, and thousands of people pass it every day, then all of those people will have an idea of what it takes to grow food, which right now we are losing. So uh, there, no, there's so many benefits that come from putting agricultural into cities, um, and only one of those benefits is growing food for the people there to eat. There's lots of other uh, kind of corollary benefits. So, mm -hmm. can you maybe can you maybe speak to some of those benefits? I, I know that um, we we've discussed as as uh, in the past that you know if you're only focusing on growing food, you're missing a whole bunch of the, the big picture of what the benefits that this could happen. Can you maybe speak to to some of those that you've seen? Oh. Mm, sure. Yeah, and really the benefits of uh, urban agriculture really come into play mostly when you look at a whole system that occurs within a city and different forces and flows that affect one another. Um, so if you started a farm in a city, you might need compost for it. And there's a lot of food waste in a city. So developing that food waste into compost could mean that the farm is getting fertilized by resources already in the city. Um, certainly, you could create jobs for people, so you could locate your farm um, the way I think Michael Abelman in Vancouver has. You locate your farm in a low-income neighborhood and directly employ people that need work. Um, you work with local restaurants to get that stuff onto their menus, so now you're creating more visibility of it and you're creating some economic value chains. Um, <clears throat> You can decrease heat island effect, um, so you can actually decrease uh, the, the ways that cities heat up when they're all paved. You can capture stormwater, which is a really important thing when we're looking at greater rain events and potential for flooding. Uh, you increase biodiversity by usually giving a place for insects or birds to have some habitat. Uh, I mean, there's a number of direct ecological and environmental benefits. Um, obviously, the employment and economic benefits are there. Um, and the social ones too. I mean, just having, having spaces where people can, can see food happening, uh, mm. has really important civic, civic benefits by understanding where letting people understand better where they fit into the big picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think that that's uh, I mean, that's that's quite quite the list for for uh, a set of benefits. And I think the other one that, that uh, we've spoken about recently is uh, with with some of some colleagues is um, that idea of building uh, real ownership and, and a sense of place. Um, so for mm -hmm. folks that are in the urban design field or the planning fields, um, what the outcomes they've been trying to achieve, uh, food can provide a new set of tools in the toolkit. Uh, to get people to really take ownership of place in a different way because they're uh, literally getting their hands dirty uh, in a place, uh, growing food, uh, trading food, sharing community. And I think that that's, um, that's something that really has a lot of potential to um, – yeah, add that that sense of place, particularly in the spaces that you're talking about, the underutilized spaces um, that in, in our communities. And you touched on just then what I think is another truth of food system planning is that many other disciplines and many other practices uh, have started to find excitement and enthusiasm 
around food. So you mentioned urban designers and people that are doing placemaking, for instance. Um, but people in public health or healthcare, um, people in education, uh, economic development folks, planners, um, community organizers and activists, um, people working on re-entering populations. So veter returning veterans or people recovering from addiction, um, any number of people going through transitions in their lives can find benefit in uh, – in these sort of open-ended, usually inclusive community-based food projects. Right, right. Uh, can you maybe maybe explain um, and share your experiences on the Rally Food Corridor project? I think that's that's um, yeah. I've been fascinated to see how that's gone over over time. Hmm, sure. the The Rally Food Corridor uh, is a is a collective impact project. Uh, we initiated it here at Community Food Lab as a way to align multiple organizations around this idea that food could bring together diverse neighborhoods, diverse communities, and create a bridging dialogue between them. So uh, the corridor itself connected um, affluent neighborhoods as well as very low-income neighborhoods, traditionally white neighborhoods with traditionally African-American neighborhoods, um, residential and downtown. and. Really, the idea was to engage organizations and community members and businesses um, in a kind of a positive vision for for food in our communities. Um, over time, we've gone through some strategic planning processes. We've gone through some like mission development. Um, we've you know developed a core group of about eight to ten organizations. Um, that are pretty committed to it. And we've developed two sort of activities, sort of uh, mutually reinforcing activities that all of our partners see value in and they all can play a part in. Um, the first is called Second Saturday, which is one day a month where we celebrate local food and community by really promoting as many sort of local food or the gardening or restaurant or you know, any kind of events or things like that that people can participate in. Um, and we just ran the numbers. I think we've had about maybe about 4,000 participants this summer, I think in six, six months of that. Um, and, and over a hundred different organizations participating. Um, so, and that's mostly volunteer, mostly volunteer based. So, um, we feel pretty good about the, where that's been going. Um, and then the other activity, are called nutrition hubs. And so we are just launching a pilot project um, around these. And the idea of a nutrition hub is that um, a, a neighborhood of need is identified and a site within that neighborhood that already has some sort of momentum, whether it's a community garden, a uh, community kitchen, maybe some teaching happening in the kitchen, maybe some urban agriculture happening. There's already some food momentum happening at that site. And our job in the Raleigh Food Corridor is to pull together a conversation of a lot of partners to develop an action plan around turbocharging that site to meet multiple neighborhood needs. So it's about co-locating co-locating as many services and programs as we can at one place so that the neighborhood has easier access, fewer barriers, and more chance of um, kind of coincidentally coming across something they didn't know about before. Um, so, so we have two, two nonprofit organizations are serving as our pilot sites, and we've had a series of workshops um, with you know pretty good participation among organizations and community members to develop an action plan for each site. Um, and we'll be finalizing those action plans. So, um, for instance, one goal might be increase fresh food retail in the neighborhood. And one of the actions there might be um, connect the local urban farmer with a convenience store in the neighborhood and just get some fresh produce from around the block onto the shelf in the convenience store. Um, so a number of actions that are meant to be kind of small scale that really pull together multiple partners. And the Raleigh Food Quarter will be helping facilitate those actions and also evaluating the process over the next year. Um, and in the meantime, we're hoping to replicate the model 
in other parts of the county. So we've already got some interest in at least three other sites, um, other neighborhoods where action planning and collective organizing is important. And we're starting some conversations about bringing this model to some other neighborhoods. So, um, so it's, it's been, so the Raleigh food quarter has been in a lot of ways, a big experiment. Um, it's taught, it's taught us a lot about the city that we live in, the city that we work in. Um, it's let us build a lot of new relationships. Um, and it's let us test out a lot of different approaches to, um, community food system development. Right. All part of that design thinking approach of prototyping and a bias toward action rather than sitting around and doing a bunch of research papers. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Very cool. Um, okay. So one, one question we, we wrap up uh, our conversations with is, uh, can you tell us about a city you love and why? Well, that's a, this is a very difficult question. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of cities out there, and for somebody that loves cities, um, you know, um, I think I'm just gonna. Uh, I feel like is, there, is I don't know if there's that a right answer to this question. Absolutely um, not. You know, I have a real love hate thing with it, but Boston. Um, I was lucky enough to live in Boston for six years, and the the quality of the streets in Boston are incredible. Um, the architecture is wonderful. Um, there is a progressive attitude about city making and city building there that I think is is really starting to starting to take shape. I think over the last five or 10 years, they've initiated a lot of really incredible things. And so from a sort of political standpoint, from a city making standpoint, I think Boston is great. Um, but just from a personality kind of vibe, walking around on the streets in Boston and neighborhoods, um, very, some very different neighborhoods, but there's some age, there's some patina, there's some unexpected stuff that you come across. Um, and, you know, for me, it was kind of a love hate thing. I think that I was going through a tough time in my life. And I think that, um, it was difficult to feel as though I really belonged there in some ways. Mm. Um, but it was also a city that I think has a really strong place in my heart, um, that, uh, I really enjoy visiting. So, okay. Thank you. Thank you for making that hard choice of picking one. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Um, okay. And I guess I should give you one, one, uh, additional update. Uh, Aaron has been, uh, up to Calgary and has stayed at my house and got to know my family a bit. And the latest, uh, local food, uh, development with my family is, uh, we have a neighbor across the way that has a bunch of crab apples. They let fall to the ground every year. So, uh, my daughter and I, uh, harvested a whole bunch and we have a ton of apple butter made from it, as well as we're experimenting with some, uh, crab apples apple bitters to go with your North Carolina bourbon. So, uh, I'll have to send some your way. So you need some, you know, we don't make a lot of bourbon in North Carolina. Well, the South. <laughs> I'll take some, I'll, I will take some bitters and I'll figure out a way to get you some bourbon. How's that? Uh, sounds like we have a deal. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. 360 Degree City is created by our team at Intelligent Futures, a firm that works at the intersection of urbanism, sustainability, engagement, and design. This week, you also heard from Jean Rowe, our intern extraordinaire. You can find show notes and links to Aaron's great work and other resources on our website at 360degree.city. We would love if you would subscribe, rate, and give us a review wherever you get your podcasts. I'm John Lewis. Thanks for stopping by. 